questions. Questions are held. Then I have the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, the Prime Minister has said that he had no choice but to double the national debt, increase inflation and interest rates, because all spending was absolutely necessary. Yet we've learned today that among the $54 million spent on the Arrive Can application, 76% of the consultants hired did no work at all. Will the Prime Minister get our money back and stop the waste? Then I have this the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Canadians understand very, very well that when the Conservatives talk about spending, what they want to do is make cuts. They want to cut dental care for Canadians. They want to cut child care services. They want to cut investments in the green economy. That is the reality of Conservative politics, which is so dangerous for Canada. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. We will cut the $54 million spent on the Arrive Can app, which is an example of corruption and scandal from the Liberals. In addition, there's the carbon tax on farmers. I said the other day that the leader of the bloc supports 100% of the economic policies of the Liberals. Spending, taxes, higher inflation, higher interest rates, and he went, he flipped out. But the bloc leader said he will do an about face and will vote to keep the carbon tax on farmers' barns. How much will it cost farmers and those who buy food? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, obviously, as an Anglophone, a member for Ontario, I can't speak for the bloc. But I know that Quebec, the nation of Quebec, understands the importance of the environment, understands the importance of industrial investments in the green economy. We are proud to do so. We are proud to do it with the support of all of the members who understand the importance of this for Canada. The Honourable, member, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. When the Prime Minister doubled the debt, drove inflation and interest rates to their highest levels in a generation, he said he had no choice. Every penny he spent was necessary. Along comes ArriveCan, a $54 million app we didn't need, didn't work and could have been done for two or three hundred thousand dollars. Now we learn, uh, based on the Ombudsman's audit, that 76 percent of the contractors did absolutely no work for the money they received. Will the Prime Minister get taxpayers back this stolen money and stop the waste that is not worth here, the cost? Here, here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker. Canadians have learned through bitter experience that when Conservatives talk about the public finances, what they're really talking about is cutting the government support Canadians depend on. What they are talking about is cutting early learning and child care, which is supporting labour force participation at record levels in Canada and, by the way, making life more affordable for Canadian families. They want to cut dental care, Mr. Speaker. They want to cut essential investments in our green future. Indeed. Indeed. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. We want to cut waste and mismanagement that has right. risen to a level that is not worth the cost after eight years of this Prime Minister. Speaking of wasteful, uh, this Prime Minister loves to lecture Canadians on how they use energy. Uh, he says that he's just like every other Canadian when he uh, stays with a friend at an $89,000 a week vacation. The average Canadian uh, emits 15 tonnes of carbon per year. His trip emitted 100 tonnes of carbon in one week. Did he pay the full carbon tax on each tonne he admitted for his luxurious vacation? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, since we're asking questions of MPs, I have a couple of questions for the Leader of the Opposition. I'd like to know how much 
Ranch Cheating, the 19-room government mansion that he lives in costs. That would be interesting for Canadians to understand. And, you know, the good news for Canadians is we're helping them with the cost of heating with the carbon rebate. So I want to know, did his family cash their carbon rebate check? It's oh. almost a thousand bucks. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I can tell the, the member that I pay for my own vacations and that of my family. And, <laughs> and M M Mr. Speaker, Canadians who pay for their own vacations are also paying too much for food. We have a bill, a common sense conservative bill, C234, that would take the carbon tax off the farmers that feed us and the consumers that desperately need to put nutrition on their table. Will the Prime Minister stop blocking the bill, pass this law so that Canadians can afford food? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, people who live in glass houses really should not throw stones. And the Leader of the Opposition may be bragging about what he pays for, but I think Canadians should understand he doesn't pay any rent on that 19-room mansion that he lives in. In fact, he's been on the government payroll for more than 20 years, and he qualified for a full pension at 35, Mr. Speaker. And now he wants to take the rebates away from Ontario families. A thousand bucks a year, he wants to take that away. That was great. The Honourable Member for, the Honourable Member for La Prairie. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said that immigration levels are based on our ability to welcome and integrate newcomers. Unfortunately, that is totally false. In 2022, his public service warned him that if he increased his immigration targets, he would worsen, among, among other things, the housing crisis. The Prime Minister did it anyway. Now he must correct his lack of judgment. On November 1st, the Prime Minister pledged to review his immigration targets starting in 2024 based on intake capacity after consulting Quebec. Will he keep his word? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, we are welcoming people and building housing at the same time. That is why we are negotiating an agreement with Quebec for $2.8 billion to build 23,000 housing units. And with our partners in Quebec to welcome newcomers who contribute essential skills to our economy and build houses at the same time. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, the Liberals knew that raising immigration levels would worsen the housing crisis. They did it anyway. And now, even with the consequences staring them in the face, they're not even correcting the situation. No, on the contrary, in 2024, they'll increase again to 485,000 people. And in 2025, 500,000 people. Even in the midst of a crisis, they continue to increase immigration targets against the advice of their public service and economists. When will they be responsible enough to adjust their targets to our capacity? The Honourable Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. The member opposite seems to forget that we have a unique agreement with Quebec, the Canada-Quebec Agreement that transfers over $700 million annually to Quebec to manage its levels. They have the almost exclusive capacity to choose the people who go to Quebec. We will work with Quebec to ensure that it works with their capacity, but I'd like to ask a, a question. He seems to want to cut immigration. Where would he want to cut? The Honourable Member from, from Burnaby South. What do you get with 24 Liberal MPs in Toronto? A housing crisis. A Davenport MP that gaslights and attacks the city and the housing workers that are struggling to make sure people have a place to call home. Whether you were born here or moved here, no one should live on the streets. The city and the housing groups are just asking the Liberal government to do their fair share. So will the Liberals provide the $250 million that Toronto needs now? Here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance. 
Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member opposite for the very important question and for pointing to the importance of the great city I have the privilege of representing, Toronto, which is such an engine of economic growth for our entire country. Mr. Speaker, we are having very constructive conversations with the City of Toronto and with the Province of Ontario. We are providing $1.5 billion for Toronto in 23-24. We're there for Toronto more than any government in Canadian history. Bravo. 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 The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. We need to let down Toronto. Yeah. Hier, le de l Yesterday, the Minister of Industry gave me a good laugh. He said he was disappointed in the big grocery chains after asking people to look at the flyers. And after failing to stabilize prices, he concluded that another investigation was needed. We know the problem. People are being ripped off while CEOs are lining their pockets. When will the Liberals stop protecting the profits of big grocers? Oh. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. I'd like to thank my colleague for his important question. Mr. Speaker, the price of groceries is an issue that affects all Canadians. That is why, Mr. Speaker, Canadians understand that the best way to stabilize prices in the medium and long term is to have more competition in the country. That is exactly why we've amended the Competition Act in December to give more power to the competition agent. And yesterday, I asked him to use his new powers to help stabilize prices in Canada. The leader of the NDP should be pleased with that action. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. Another year means another carbon tax increase on April 1st. It was minus 50 in some places in this country where Canadians can't even afford to heat their homes. Yesterday, the finance minister lectured Canadians on her out-of-touch version of events, and then we learned that the Liberals were going to change the name of the carbon tax. Taking money out of the pockets of Canadians rebranded is still taking money out of their pockets. So instead of paying high-priced consultants to remove the car to remove the carbon tax or change the carbon tax name, they should take some free advice and cancel it April 1st. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what is really out of touch. What, about, what is out of touch is for a Toronto MP like the one opposite, sitting opposite, to be saying to the people of Ontario, to the hardworking families of Ontario, we are going to take away the $974 you are getting back thanks to the price on pollution. We're going to cut that money that goes directly to your family budget. Oh, and by the way, we're going to cut daycare and dental care along the way too. That's not going to help anyone in Canada. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, I, ne I have, don't remember a government so indifferent to the plight of Canadians. Yeah. Her advice of cutting Disney Plus is cold comfort to the woman who's putting water in her children's milk. The cost of some produce is up 94% since she got here. They can lower the cost of food, of gas, of home heating by cancelling the increase instead of quadrupling the tax. They paused it for one region where their MPs re uh, revolted. Where are the rest of their silent MPs who should yeah. be speaking up for their neighbours that are asking to cancel the increase? Yeah, yeah. Minister for Finance and Deputy Prime Minister. Speaker, when it comes to being out of touch with regular Canadians, let me tell you what was out of touch. It was having a temporary leader who charged 20 grand to move into her temporary house and then charged Canadian taxpayers more than $5,000 for bed and bath linens. That's for towels and sheets. And Mr. Speaker, what Canadians need to know is these Conservatives would cut child care, they would cut dental care, and they would cut the carbon rebate people are getting. The Honourable Member from Lakeland. 
that prime deputy prime minister is so out of touch. This is the truth. After eight years, Canadians can't afford to eat, heat, or house themselves. Last year, two million Canadians needed help from food banks every month. That's a shocking 78% increase from just two years before. And food banks say 2024 will be even worse. The Conservative Common Sense Bill C-234 would take the tax off farmers to lower food prices right now, but the Liberals force senators to gut it. So why won't the Liberals axe the tax from farmers to bring down food prices for Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons from these austerity Conservatives when it comes to supporting the most vulnerable Canadians. Since we formed government, 2.3 million Canadians have been lifted out of poverty, and the poverty rate has fallen from 14.5% when they were in government to 7.4%. They want to cut child care, they want to cut dental care, and that MP from Alberta wants to cut the $1,500 Alberta families are getting from the price on pollution. The Honourable Member from Lakeland. Well, listen, the Liberals' schemes, scams and spin jobs don't help the millions of desperate, hungry Canadians here, here. struggling just here. to get by every single month. This is the fact. When you tax the farmer who produces the food, the trucker who ships the food, and then the cost of heating and cooling and storing the food, Canadians can't afford the food. But these out-of-touch carbon tax crusaders, they don't care. And they're going to quadruple it on April 1st. Conservatives will ask the tax for all for good. But why won't these Liberals just pass Bill C-234, reject the Senate amendments, tax the tax from farmers and bring down food prices today? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, I'll tell you where Conservatives were focused just over a week ago. A who's who collection of Conservatives gathered for a pep talk from far-right U.S. commentator Tucker Carlson. It's important, once again, for us to be able to hear the questions and hear the answers. I know that yesterday, if you will recall, there was a member who had complained about the noise level, which made it difficult, especially for people who need to listen to translation. That I have been is for the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, last week, a who's who of Conservatives gathered in Alberta for a lecture in a series with far-right commentator Tucker Carlson. And in that speech, one of them which focused and which had the Premier Daniel Smith attend, we heard attacks on francophones, homophobic jokes, and traditional best hits of MAGA politicians. Mr. Speaker, a Conservative nomination candidate in my writing went on Twitter, had lots of fun on it. Here's the question. Will his leader stand with the candidate or call him out, or is he standing with Tucker Carlson? The Honourable Member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadians who used to belong to the middle class are going hungry. The Prime Minister and his Radical Environment Minister know that if it costs a farmer more to grow food, it's going to cost Canadians more to buy food. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Farmers, ranchers and producers are asking for Bill C-234 to lower their costs. So will the Liberals finally reject the amendments from Bill C-234 from the Senate, remove the carbon tax completely and lower the price of food for all Canadians? Hear, hear. <laughs> The Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I fully understand the importance of looking after the land, being a farmer, I fully understand, and taking steps to prepare the industry for the future. Mr. Speaker, that's why we invested as a government $1.5 billion to make sure our farmers and ranchers and processors are ready for the future. We are going to continue to make sure our farmers and ranchers remain on the cutting edge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, the two million Canadians who rely on food banks deserve better than that cheap deflection. One in five Ontario households who struggle to put food on their tables deserve better. They need this government to stop inflating food prices. They need the Prime Minister to stand up to his radical environment minister and carve out the inflationary carbon tax for our farmers, producers and ranchers. So will the Liberals finally do the right thing? Reject the Senate amendments to Bill C-234, remove the carbon tax for farmers and lower the price of food for Canadians. Yeah. If I could ask members, especially members whose voices do carry, the member from Calgary Signal Hill, please, to allow the question to be asked so that the speaker can hear it clearly. The Honourable right uh, Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my honourable colleague's question, but being a farmer, she must fully understand it's so important that we invest in what farmers do. When you see what takes place across the country with the devastating fires, the devastating floods, it's so important that we take care of the environment. Farmers fully understand you have to take care of the land, you have to take care of the environment, and if not, your food price will increase dramatically. We are and will continue to make sure we support our farmers and ranchers right across this country. Well done. The Honourable Member for Lac saint jean Since 2021, the federal government has been withholding the money it owes Quebec for receiving asylum seekers. It's been so long that the bill has reached $470 million. Yesterday, finally, Ottawa leaked to the papers that it would be announcing some good news today. It's quarter to three and still nothing. Yesterday, in his first answer in 2024, the minister talked about plain politics on the backs of immigrants. Do you know what plain politics at the expense of immigrants is? It is withholding for years the money needed to provide them with services. Where is the money? The Honourable Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. Mr. Speaker, the member was here in the House. He didn't learn that in the news. I announced that there would be good news this week. It will be under my authority. It won't be meeting all of the demands of Quebec, but it will be, we will be supporting them in receiving asylum seekers and supporting Quebec in its efforts to ensure that these people are accompanied well. This is a responsibility at both levels of government, and we will continue our good work together. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Quebec doesn't play politics on the backs of immigrants. These people need services, and Quebec is scrambling to provide them at Quebecer's expense. People first, money later. It's only here in Ottawa that politics is lacking. It's just here that the government has been trying for years to save money on the backs of asylum seekers and Quebecers. Today, I invite the federal government to take up its responsibilities. Where is the $470 million? The Honourable Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. Mr. Speaker, you'll agree that it's not saving money to give $700 million a year to Quebec under the Canada-Quebec Agreement. In addition to the $700 million, we've never asked for accounting, but there will need to be a conversation about that with Quebec. We're ready to do so. We've had good discussions already, and there will be good news later this week. The Honourable Member for Lac saint jean Obviously, the heart of the matter is the quality of services offered to asylum seekers. Money is essential, but it's about much more than money. Last year alone, Quebecers welcomed more than 65,000 asylum seekers, almost half the total for the whole of Canada. Our public services and community organizations are overwhelmed. We don't have enough resources. Our capacity has been exceeded. So in the interest of fairness, but above all, to guarantee asylum seekers adequate services, will the minister finally organize the distribution of the reception of asylum seekers with the provinces? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. The member opposite has admitted that it's a responsibility of both levels of government, yet last year he claimed it was only Canada that had to spend money. 
It's clear that we will work together, that we need to do more work. There are two provinces that are overwhelmed, Quebec and Ontario. It's a work that we can do together. We are a federation. The Honourable Member from Hastings and Lennox and Addington. Mr. Speaker, for far too many Canadians, the dream of home ownership is dead, and it lays squarely on this Liberal NDP government. After eight years, mortgages have doubled, and a staggering three out of four families cannot afford a home. Canadians know that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost, a cost brought about by a truly impressive mix of arrogance and indifference to the suffering of many Canadians. Mr. Speaker, when will this government take a break from their Jamaican junkets and actually address the housing hell in Canada? Canada. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, with respect, my honourable colleague is simply trying to prey on the very real anxiety that families are feeling across this country. But at the same time, she advances a plan that will build fewer homes than we are already on track to build. We have removed the GST from home building in this country. The Conservatives want to put it back on. We are investing directly in affordable housing. The Conservatives want to cut it. And we have put a $4 billion fund on the table to reduce red tape with cities, and they've committed to doing away with that too. We'll get the homes built. They only stay in the way. Your Honourable Member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Mr. Speaker, more empty words while Canadians are spiralling out of control. It's not only home ownership that this Liberal NDP government has managed to turn from a dream into a nightmare, but it's rent as well. In the last two years alone, rent has increased by 22 per cent. That's nearly $400 a month. After eight years of their war on affordable housing and rent, this government is forcing Canadians out from the suburbs and into tent cities and parking lots. Mr. Mr. Speaker, when will this government stop the photo ops and actually fix the housing and affordability crisis hammering Canadians? Yeah! The Honourable Minister for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, for years the Conservative approach to policies that will actually help people is to prey on their anxieties rather than advance ideas that will actually address them. The member is supporting her leader's plan, which is going to build fewer homes than we are already on track to build. We have removed the GST from apartments to help bring down rent. She's campaigning on a commitment to put that GST back on for a lot of middle class apartments, which will increase the cost of living. When it comes to affordable housing, we have put programs in place to support their construction. They have promised to cut it. We are going to continue to put money on the table to build more homes. Their policies will drive up rent. Before I give the floor to the member for Louis Saint Laurent, I will invite members out of respect for those who need to listen to the to the interpretation to please stop commenting during questions and answers. I invite the member for Louis Saint Laurent to speak. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal housing crisis is hitting everywhere. CBC told us yesterday that students in Montreal, university students, are now going to a shelter for the homeless. The director said that this shows how bad the crisis is. This is not a solution. It takes places away from people who are homeless. This doesn't have make any sense that it's happening in Montreal, in Canada. With the bloc supporting the Liberals' economic policies, when will the government finally understand that inflationary budgets help no one? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. We understand well the challenges that young people in this country are facing when it comes to finding a place to live that they can actually afford. That's why just yesterday we advanced a new policy that's going to make low-cost loans available to build more student residences across this country. We're going to continue to advance policies that don't just allow students to find a place that they can afford next to where they go to school, but it's going to free up supply that exists within communities today. The Conservatives will tap into people's anxieties for their political gain. We will advance policies that actually address the Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. This is the truth, the reality of Canadians on a daily basis. Yes. For eight years, this government has been making rents and homes twice as expensive. We need 3.5 million new homes, but we're not getting them. Millions of Canadians are going to food banks. This is shameful. When will this government act for all Canadians? The 
Honorable Ministre du Développement Régional. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, I see that my colleague is extremely passionate about this. But on this side of the House, this government since 2016 has brought in the first ever Canada housing strategy, which has put a roof over the heads of Canadians throughout the country. Instead of being in a party which likes to insult our mayors, insulting the mayors in Quebec really means insulting all Quebecers, Mr. Speaker. From North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, no one should miss a meal. But seniors in Canada can't afford sky-high grocery prices. While big grocery CEOs rack in record profits, seniors are making difficult decisions in the grocery store. It doesn't stop there. Loblaws even tried to cut discounts on nearly expired food. Wow. Corporate greed has no limit. And while the Liberals continue to let it happen, the Conservative opposition wants to let that those big companies get even more of a payout. Why are the Liberals allowing CEOs to go Canadians? <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the Honourable Member for her question. We remain focused on the affordability needs of seniors. In fact, we're very proud on this side of the House that one of the first things that we did is make sure that the age for OAS was maintained at 65 years old, not 67. This is not a change that should have been made here in this House or a change that should have been made at the World Economic Forum in which it was in Davos, Switzerland. We instead are maintaining and increasing supports for seniors in this country. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Hamilton Centre. When it comes to the over 25,000 Palestinians killed by Netanyahu's brutal bombardment, the Liberals have done nothing to uphold international law and protect innocent civilian lives. And when it comes to Islamophobia and anti-Palestinian hate crimes, the Liberals have failed to stop it here in Canada. The community feels so betrayed that yesterday, the National Council of Canadian Muslims cancelled their meeting with the Prime Minister because they are tired of his broken lies. So, wh what will it take? The Honourable Member is an experienced uh, parliamentarian. Uh, he knows very well that we cannot accuse Honourable Members of deliberately lying. That is a that is a uh, unparliamentary language. I'll ask the Honourable Member to uh, to withdraw that comment. Mr. Speaker, I withdraw because they are tired of the broken promises. So, what will it take for this Liberal government to listen and start protecting Palestinian lives in Gaza and combat Islamophobia and anti-Palestinian hate here in Canada? The Honourable Minister for International Development. Give me a, a, an opportunity to talk about the announcement we made today precisely to deal with this issue. $40 million additional to deliver life-saving food, medicine and other supplies to Palestinians through trusted international partners including the World Health Organization, the World Food Program, UNICEF and many others. We've always centered our decisions around the protection of innocent civilians in Gaza and through this uh, allocation we have upped our game to $100 million in humanitarian assistance to Palestinians. The Honourable Member from Scarborough Centre. Uh, Mr. Bond Speaker, Bridge. for the past few months, there has been a significant rise in, the impact, in hate impacting communities across the country. All of us have a role to play during these difficult times to bring Canadians together. Can the Minister of Diversity, Inclusion and Persons with Disabilities share some of the measures we have taken to support Canadians and encourage unity? Good job. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, during this difficult time for so many communities, we know that there is still more that unite, unites us than divides us as Canadians. That's why, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce $3 million towards a building community resiliency call to action. This funding seeks to support local initiatives that drive positive change by building bridges and connecting communities together. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to fighting discrimination and racism, let's learn about each other from one another. Our focus continues to be by working together to heal divides and protect communities from hate right here at home. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Portneuf, Jacques Cartier. 
Mr. Speaker, this government has been in power for eight years, and look how much it's harmed our country. This Liberal Prime Minister has plunged Canadians into the worst housing crisis in our history. We, the Conservative Party, have a plan to compensate towns that speed up new housing starts, like Saguenay, Trois-Rivières, and Victoriaville. What is the Prime Minister doing for desperate families who cannot pay the rent, or those who can't even find a home? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, it must be very hard to be a Conservative member from Quebec. Before the holidays, they voted against Quebec several times, against farmers, against the Magdalene Islands, against the Santite Festival. And just now, their leader made it even worse by coming to Quebec and insulting people. So I'd invite them to leave the dark side and come to our side and work for all Quebecers. The Honourable Member for Port Neuf, Jacques Cartier. Thank you. Once again, Mr. Speaker, this government is engaged in disinformation. The, 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 Gaspésie -les the member for Gaspésie-les-Îles misled the House. She should rather pay attention to her own region. Gaspésie and the Magdalene Islands are suffering an unprecedented housing crisis. And that's not just according to me. It's also according to Ambroise Henry, the leader of the Gaspésie Magdalene Islands Collective Housing Resource Group. What is the minister doing? What is the member doing to help people in that region concretely? It's really hard to hear. It's really hard to hear members who are speaking up from various parts of the room. So I'd like to ask all members to maintain, uh, uh, to remain silent. Mr. Speaker, as I said yesterday, I would ask the member to take back what he said. After all, we know that people from the Magdalene Islands care deeply. If my colleague really has a spine, he should rise and apologize to people from the Magdalene Islands for what he said. Is interpretation working? Members know very well then that one cannot tarnish the reputation of a member in particular. So I would ask the minister to withdraw what she said about the member for Pont Neuf Jacques Cartier. I apologize. Je remercie la ministre. I'd like to thank the minister. From Dufferin Caledon. Every day the Minister of Housing rises in this house, he's got a new program, a new announcement, uh, the checks in the mail, all of these things. the member from Dufferin Caledon to start from the top. I will invite I will invite other members to please listen to the question without interruption. The honourable member from Dufferin Caledon from the top. Mr. Speaker, every day this housing minister pops up and he has a new program, a new plan. House Leader and the Chief Whip to please, if they could uh, ask their members to listen quietly to the question without interruption. From
The Honourable Member from Dufferin Caledon from the top, and I hope it will be the last time he will have to start his question again. Every day, this housing minister pops up and celebrates his new announcement, his new project, his new scheme. But the sad thing is, they don't actually build a single house. Meanwhile, in the real world, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, rents are skyrocketing. In fact, asking rent is now up 22%. Donna in Orangeville's rent is going up again and she can't afford it. When will this minister realize these announcements are doing nothing, housing's a disaster, apologize to Donna. The Honourable Minister for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Uh, Mr. Speaker, perhaps my honourable colleague is confused about the pace at which we're advancing new policies because he's not used on the Conservative side to seeing the work actually getting done. to theirs, they would put Canada on a track to build fewer homes than we were already projecting to have built in the years ahead. We have cut taxes, they will raise them. We have made investments, they will cut them. We have completely changed the way that large cities in this country are zoning to build more housing. The Conservatives oppose that too. We will do what it takes to build homes, to bring down rents, and make sure every Canadian has a roof over. The Honourable Member from Dufferin Caledon. Except all that leads us to exactly where we are today. Nowhere. Rent for a one-bedroom apartment up 12% to $1,900. Rent for a two-bedroom apartment up 9.8% to $2,300. Rent is now at a record high across Canada, $2,100 up 8.6%. Why? Because all they have are these phony announcements and photo ops. When will he finally admit they've made the mess that Canadians are suffering through? Apologize to People like Donna apologize to Canadians. It's their mess. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, since the adoption of the National Housing Strategy, there are hundreds of thousands of homes that have been constructed or renovated to support Canadians who need help. There are millions of Canadians who have benefited directly from government supports to ensure that they could keep a roof over their head. We are going to continue to put policies in place that will improve the quality of life people get to enjoy by helping them find a place that they can afford. The Conservative plan would raise taxes on home building, would cut funding for cities that are trying to change their rules and would eliminate supports for affordable housing altogether. That is the wrong approach. It was tried. It has failed. We will build the homes to support Canadians. The Honourable Member for Bhopal Limoilou. Mr. Speaker, a federal public servant from the Quebec City region has a debt of $25,000, all due to the government. It all started in 2016, when the Phoenix pay system started, quote-unquote, forgetting to pay this civil servant over and over. Today, seven years later, despite everything that he's done, he's had to remortgage his home, and that has caused a great deal of stress. Now, if it were the minister who was not getting paid, would we really see the system forgetting to pay him over and over? The Honourable Minister of Public Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my colleague knows, and as she said very eloquently, it's unacceptable that public servants who work so hard to support the public service are not being paid on time and appropriately. That is why every day we must work harder to ensure that people, like the one my colleague spoke about, receive the money they've earned for the hard work they've done and for all the time and hard work they've put into serving our country. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, even if this were just an individual case, it would be shameful. But actually, there are 448,000 pay problems from Phoenix, and that's just in 2023. In fact, many public servants are deciding not to change their address or deciding not to accept a promotion because they're worried that even if there's a slight change, they'll fall through the cracks in the system. And the worst thing is that this government doesn't seem to think that it's that important to pay what it owes to its own employees. When will the minister finally open his eyes and do something about this unbelievable fiasco, which would lead any private company to bankruptcy? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. 
Once again, I'd like to thank my colleague for raising this issue. She is right. We need to invest more to ensure that we're paying our public servants. And that is why we are currently hiring hundreds of new compensation advisors. We are investing in better technologies that will enable us to better communicate information between the departments and the pay center with most of its employees in Miramichi. We've already done a lot, but there's still a great deal more to do over the next few months. The Honourable Member from Northumberland, uh, uh, sorry, Peterborough South, Peterborough. Northumberland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. These Liberals are great at breaking things. They've broken the bank, they've broken the law, and they've broken the budget. It turns out that budgets don't balance themselves. Record government spending leads to record inflation and soaring interest rates. Canadians need the budget fixed. A dollar of new spending must be met with a dollar of savings. It's a simple concept. Even children can understand it. Will these Liberals finally end their inflationary spending, or will they keep breaking the budget? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, bitter experience has taught Canadians that whenever Conservatives talk about public finances, whenever they talk about saving money, what they're talking about is taking money away from Canadians. They are talking, to be very specific, about taking away early learning and childcare. They are talking about taking away dental care. And they are talking about taking away the investments in things like the EV factories in Ontario that are the jobs of today and the future. Excellent. The Honourable Member from Northumberland, Peterborough South. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what Conservatives are going to cut. We're going to cut broken apps. We're going to cut high-priced consultants because Canadi because Conservatives talk directly to Canadians, so we don't need to spend billions of dollars to find out what Canadians think. And let me tell you what Canadians are thinking. They want to axe the tax. They want to fix the budget. They want to build homes. They want to stop crime. Will these Liberals finally listen to them? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, we've learned just now about one specific thing Canadians will cut. I'm an MP for Ontario, the member opposite is too. They're going to cut the nearly $1,000 that an average family of, that a family of four in Ontario is getting right now. That is money that is helping people every day. Of course they're going to cut child care. They voted against it. They're going to cut dental care, and they will not make the investments our economy needs. Then I have deputed... The Honourable Member for Montmagny, Lisley, Kamouraska, Rivière du Loup. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government has been spending without limits for years. Arrive Can, the Green Fund, which is turning to something like the sponsorship scandal, the Infrastructure Bank, and all of these other wasteful forms of spending, which are preventing it from balancing the budget. And that's without even considering the astronomical, astronomical sums they're giving consultants. We, the Conservatives, are asking for a plan to return to a balanced budget. Will this government listen to common sense and get back to a balanced budget in a predictable manner? Will it lay out a plan in its next budget? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to hear a question about our government's investments from a Quebec MP because that will enable me to speak about our investment in child care. That was originally a Quebec initiative. We are very proud of helping Quebec with this important issue. And we're also very proud about the fact that we work closely with the province and have made the biggest investment in the history of Quebec. The Honourable Member for saint Leonard saint michel Mr. Speaker, our government cares about the East End of Montreal. It has been neglected for a long time and associated with refineries and heavy industry. But now we are going to make it into an economic and social hub. Can the minister tell us how the federal government, with other levels of government, is participating in various efforts to revitalize the East End of Montreal and how we are supporting businesses like Laboratoire MZL the 
The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, when I ran in 2019, and with the support of the government, we committed to organizing the first ever East End of Montreal Summit. That was held last November. We brought together nearly 800 participants from all levels of government, and we announced $750 million in investment. We were supported by the local Chamber of Commerce. That's the biggest group that has ever come together for this issue. We are going to work with all of our partners to ensure that this neighborhood, neighborhood's potential is realized. Honourable member from Carleton Trail, Eagle Creek. After eight years of this Liberal NDP government, Liberal insiders have never had it so good, and Canadians are paying a high price. Mm -hmm. Yesterday's Ombudsman report on ArriveCan revealed that procurement policies were ignored over and over again. Companies were given preferential treatment, even though they lied in their bids to secure millions of dollars in contracts. More Liberal corruption and waste proving that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. When will these these Liberal ministers come clean with Canadians and tell them why they gave these wor this work to their buddies. Right. Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, it's important to remember that the ArriveKin app was built to help save lives during an extraordinary time. But with that being said, Mr. Speaker, we expect the procurement process to be followed. And Mr. Speaker, I have said time and time again in this House that doing in the procurement process would face consequences. The CBSA has already begun this important work by calling in the police when necessary, by doing internal audits, and Mr. Speaker, we are committed to ensuring that the procurement processes are always followed. Big round of applause there. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Midnapore. After eight years of this Liberal NDP government, scandal continues to follow them. With the ArriveCan app, Liberals insisted there were no forged resumes. Fact, almost 40% of the resumes GC Strategy sent in were forged. Wow. Liberals insisted security was never compromised. Fact, almost 80% of all contracts did not follow security protocol. Liberals insisted procurement rules were followed. Fact, the system was rigged in favour of GC Strategies. So so I have a question for this Liberal government. What kind of operation are you running over there? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, what we expect from the public service is to implement contracts based on government policies that follow the rules and procurement policies. And Mr. Speaker, when we were aware... I can ask colleagues to please uh, have an opportunity so that I could hear the answer from the Honourable Member, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When our government released government policies during this global pandemic to help save Canadian lives, we expected the public service to implement these contracts following the procurement policies and rules set out by this government. Mr. Speaker, we are concerned with some of the initial findings. So is the CBSA president. That is why she has already implemented measures, including calls calling in the police when necessary, as well as condu conducting more internal audits. And there will be consequences for anyone who did not follow the procurement processes. The Honourable Member from Leeds-Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Vito Lakes. Well, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, we have a Prime Minister who's been caught misleading Canadians multiple times. Most recently, it's his $84,000 gifted vacation to a luxurious Jamaican villa. Now, this is what he told Canadians was that he was paying for it, but we don't know what he told the Ethics Commissioner. But now we do know that, in fact, it was a gift. He didn't pay anything. He took an $84,000 gift. The Ethics Commissioner said that, unlike what the Government House Leader said, the trip was not pre-cleared. So when will this Minister and this Prime Minister start telling Canadians the truth? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, of course, the member was able to hear this directly from the Ethics Commissioner this morning, but he appeared at committee and has been very clear on this matter. He confirmed that the office was consulted by the Prime Minister's office 
before the Prime Minister and his family went on their vacation, and he confirmed that his office provided advice on this matter and that the Prime Minister took the advice and went on a Christmas holiday with his family, Mr. Speaker. The Commissioner told committee members that as far as he is concerned, there is nothing further on this matter. The Honourable Member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Mr. Speaker, our government believes that workplaces should be safe, respectful, free from harassment and violence. The Canada Labour Code includes numerous provisions to that effect, and Canada also has international obligations that outline that same commitment. One year ago today, Canada ratified Convention 190 of the International Labour Organization on Violence and Harassment. Can the Minister of Labour provide insight on this convention and the important role that Canada plays in international organizations like the ILO? Good question. The Honourable Minister for Labour. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question. One year ago today, Canada signed Convention 190 of the International Labour Organization, which is a part of the United Nations. 190 aims to eliminate violence and harassment in workplaces across the globe because no one should face violence or harassment on the job, not in Canada, not anywhere. Today, this becomes a protected right for every worker in Canada. Mr. Speaker, Canada is proud to be a founding member of the ILO. And Mr. Speaker, let me add that on this side of the House, we are proud to be a founding member of the United Nations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from London, Fanshawe. Today I joined the hundreds of workers on strike at the Canadian Forces Morale and Welfare Services. Their key demands? Fair wages, better job security and respect. But this Liberal government refuses to even sit down to negotiate a fair deal. These are workers who support our military with critical wellness services. When they wrote to local Liberal MPs asking for support, they were told the Minister didn't know these 4,000 workers were his responsibility. Wow. Well, the Minister of National Defence finally accept his obligation to these workers and get back to the bargaining table. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Defence. For this important question, because the services provided by those non-public employees is, are important to the Canadian Armed Forces, and those workers deserve to, a decent contract. Mr. Speaker, we support a, a resolution of this labour dispute at the table, and will continue to support both sides coming back to the table. That's the right place to find a solution. The Honourable Minister, and the Honourable Member for Timmins James Bay. Another winter, another tragic fire in Treaty 9. Children at the Bamatung First Nation have no school because it burned in a fire and they had no fire service. Wow. Last winter, Piwanak lost a beautiful 10-year-old child to a fire and this government's response was, well, we'll buy you a truck, but we're not going to pay for the fire hall. How do you do fire safety at minus 45 without a fire hall? Will the minister stop nickel and diming the people at Treaty 9 and commit for all the communities properly funded fire halls, vehicles, and a new school for the children of Ibamantung because every child deserves safety and a comfy school. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Indigenous Services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think all Canadians were so sad to hear about the fire that destroyed the school in Abatong. And I spoke with Chief at Lokan on Friday night to reiterate to the Chief that we'll work with the community not just on fire prevention, of course, the truck that's waiting for the ice roads to be delivered, but also to make sure that those students have a plan to complete their year of study here. I'll be meeting with the Chief and indeed uh, the CEO of Matawa for First Nations uh, Tribal Council to be very clear about the support that our government will continue to provide to Abentong. That's all the time we have for question period today. I believe the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I think that if you seek it, you will find unanimous consent for the following. That this House calls for the immediate release of Vladimir... I'm already hearing a number of no's. I'm already hearing a number of no's. 